The humorous intro for this episode was posted separately due to it being four minutes long. You can check it out using this link. Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we have the Gibson 2013 Midtown Kalamazoo guitar in Vintage Sunburst. This is an interesting one, and it's a guitar that I've wanted to feature on the show for a long time, so I'm really happy to be able to share this with you. But... What is a Midtown guitar anyway? Midtown was a series that the Memphis plant of Gibson did that was first introduced in 2011. To boil these down, they were essentially created to make a cheaper 335. They have a flat top and are built similar to a chambered Les Paul. I had a Midtown standard with P90s back in 2015, and I'll be honest, I didn't really like that guitar. It felt stiff and just wasn't what I was expecting. Now, if you like your Midtown, remember, I'm just basing that off of one that I had. Because normally with a 335, you pick it up, it feels nice and semi-hollow, it's nice and lightweight. Except for these ones kind of got a chunky mahogany back to them. They're a little bit beefier. You really have to try one to understand what I'm talking about. But in 2013, they did this limited edition run. This one is not celebrating the 335 shape, it is celebrating the Birdland. So let's do a quick history of that model. The Birdland was first introduced in 1955. It was designed by two first call Nashville session musicians named Billy Bird and Hank Garland. And I always thought that was a strange name, now it makes sense. Essentially, they took an L5 and they made some improvements to it. They wanted a slim neck profile with a reduced from 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length down to 23 and a half. Now, the reason why they wanted those two options is because it would help them play faster and the smaller scale length made the jazz chords easier to do because some of those are finger twisters. So making the frets a little bit closer together was helpful. They also reduced how deep the body was. They chopped it down to two and a quarter inches. So what Gibson did with the Midtown Kalamazoo, it gets the Kalamazoo simply because of where the originals were made, is they gave it the same specs as the original. So reduced scale length, slim tapered neck profile, an even more thin body now, and they gave it the attributes of a 50s Birdland. You have the flower pot inlay, the binding on the headstock, the block inlays on the fretboard. They styled this after the PAF version with humbucking pickups. However, what's different between the Kalamazoo and the Birdland? First, let's talk about the major improvements that they made. This is something I didn't know before owning this guitar. Coil splits. That's beautiful on a guitar like this. And they're on the tone pots. So you got your humbucker tones and your single coil tones. And the next thing that I loved about this is stock locking Grover tuners. Amazing. I mean, these initially retailed at $14.99. So those are some pretty nice features to include. But besides those two upgrades, you really can't call this a bird land. Besides how it just vaguely looks like one. I mean, here, I'll show you two photos side by side here of a bird land and original. And yeah, these Kalamazoo's, they look really weird. They really have a strange dimension to them. But when you actually sit down with one of these, they're not quite as weird looking. The original Birdlands, they can come in a Florentine or Venetian cut. Florentine means they're pokey. I believe that's the one that Ted Nugent prefers. And then the Venetian is the more rounded off one. So depending on what Birdland you're comparing this to, it's either the same or different because you have a Venetian style on this one. Original Birdlands feature a spruce top, whereas this one features a two-piece maple. The old ones will either feature a three or five piece maple neck, whereas this one has mahogany, ebony fingerboard versus rosewood on the Kalamazoo, maple back and sides on the originals, whereas this one, it's a mahogany back. 
And one of the huge differences here is the Kalamazoo gets the ES-165 styled zigzag trapeze tailpiece, whereas the Birdlands get one that says Birdland on it. But now just to completely destroy any hope that this guitar has for being a Birdland, the original ones are 17 inches wide this way, whereas this one is 15 inches. So you got about another inch on each side of this. The bodies on the original is 21 inches long this way, whereas this one is 19. And finally, as compared to the two and a quarter inch deep of the bird lens, this one is one and 11 sixteenths. Now, if we make a really weird fraction here, that makes it one and two and three quarters quarters of an inch. So it's roughly one and a quarter inch thinner, which is nearly half as much. So a Birdland, yeah, they're not the biggest arch top you'll find, but this one is even half as much as that. So if the only thing that turns you off from these super classy guitars is how wide they are, that's kind of who the Midtown series is targeting. Because this guitar, it feels like a Les Paul in a really weird way because it's missing that girth to it. So it was instantly familiar to me, but it has that really cool jazzy aesthetic to it. Some further differences is the Kalamazoo does not have back binding whereas the originals did. And these ones have a set bridge versus the floating bridge that you can move that's just on rosewood usually. So can you call this a bird, Lynn? Yeah, not really, but even I was guilty of putting it in my listing before I really compared all these specs. So now that I've talked about some of the differences, let's go ahead, throw this thing on the workbench, tear it apart and see how it was built. You have a pair of 57 classics in this. It's just a regular 57 classic in the bridge, not a plus. And here's what the pickup routes look like. In the bridge pickup, you have the identifier mark DS, which might stand for something like dark sunburst. M for Midtown, and KM for Kalamazoo model. The bridge is your standard Nashville-styled full-weight bridge, and here's the identifier marks on the back. And the tailpiece system's kind of interesting. You can see here it operates based off of essentially a screw drilled into your top. You can see from the factory it kind of split the finish a bit right there. So yeah, that's a little shady on Gibson's part. So if you wanted to purchase one of these with the intentions of converting it to like a stop bar tailpiece, yeah, you might not want to do it because you'd have that left over. But this is the screw that goes into the body. Honestly, it looks just like something you'd use for drywall. It's kind of crude, but it screws into the body just like that and that black spacer is there to prevent it from going too far in. From there, the tailpiece kind of locks onto it right there in that middle strip. And then this is secured by the strap button as well as four screws. You can see the holes of it right there. And this thing's fairly beefy at seven and a half ounces. And the strings just lock under the tailpiece under there to be held in place. The pick guard for these is tortoise shell style. It's got that red and kind of white and yellow to it. And what's interesting is it mounts like a regular Les Paul one by utilizing two little screws into the body, but it rests on top of the pickup rings, which kind of gives it a very interesting classy vibe. And that's why you have those little cutouts there. That way you can still adjust the height of your pickups. But you can see that those screw marks aren't terribly evident if you take it off. So it's definitely an option if you don't like that pick guard to leave it off. Now let's take a look inside of these control cavities. A nice regular toggle switch cavity, nothing too much going on here, but oh my gosh, guys, wait till you see this. Whoa, that caught me off guard. It appears that they've routed some of this out so the back plate could sit flush, and then they routed just enough to make it easy for them to solder and get the wires to where they need to be. Now you'll notice that the tone pots are also push poles for coil splitting, but why did they do it like this? It's because, look at this F-hole. You look through that, what do you see? You see wood. But, 
if they would have routed that out, you would have saw the back plate through that F hole, and that would have just made the guitar kind of look cheap. Because normally, a Birdland styled guitar will not have a back access control plate. That's something they did on the Midtown series to make them easier to produce. So you can see right there where the routing is just for the pot, but that's what it would have looked like all in this area, and that would have looked terrible. So huge props to Gibson for thinking up that. I, I probably wouldn't have thought of that myself. Here you can see it is a maple top with a mahogany back with a rosewood fretboard and a mahogany neck. The body itself is 1 and 11 16 inches thick, approximately 15 inches wide, and about 11 wide at the top. And as previously mentioned, they feature the 23 and a half inch scale length. And this example weighs 7 pounds 12 ounces. Now that I've told you just about everything I can tell you about this guitar, as well as show you, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds.
that we know how this instrument sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. All right, so the story behind this one is a dad purchased this guitar for his son to learn, and it was his first guitar. Son never got around to it, it just sat in a closet for five years, and then he sold it to me. So, uh, it was used sparingly, we've got a few dings to go over, but we'll start shining the light over it. So, some polishing marks, string change, scratches on the face of the headstock. Again, you have your flower pot logo, as well as the Gibson logo in a pearloid material. Truss rod works just fine, original truss rod cover doesn't read anything. Your rosewood fretboard was just cleaned and conditioned. I didn't notice any fretware to really speak of. And this one plays great with low action. That can be adjusted lower. But speaking of adjustments, uh, the saddles are fairly low on this, but it does intonate properly if you check between the open string and the 12th fret. But it's good to know you have limited adjusting room left. But hey, that, that's how Gibson sent it out of the factory. <laughs> Being a vintage sunburst color, you've kind of got black on the edges. So that's really going to show any type of light picking wear in the form of polishing scratches and picking scratches. Important to note on the volume knob, it's like completely cracked in half. I'm sure that might break on you one day, so you might consider having a replacement around while you can still buy them before they become vintage or something. I mean, I'm sure it's good for a long time, but if that gets hit with something, it might just snap in half. But I would say the worst thing condition-wise is right up here by the pick guard. There is a ding right there. There, we can see it. It's, it's a little bit of an eyesore, I won't lie. When you're playing this, once you know it's there, you're gonna be like, yep, there it is. There's that ding on the top. But other than that, you just have some very light finish checking. In here, you can kind of see it along the edge of the binding. That's just a factory defect. There's also two finish check lines that run from here and there. Back of the instrument, serial number 13, 11, 30, 44, 8. This is a 2013 model. Again, you've got your locking Grover tuners. No breaks, cracks, or repairs to this mahogany neck. I don't see any major nicks or dings on this. Dark heel, Gibson 90s style like that. I don't see major wear. I mean, you might find some light buckle marks, but you know, just your average lightly played guitar. The back plate does still have the plastic over it. If you want to remove it, you won't have those little spots anymore. You can see some light finish checking around the neck joint. That's pretty common. And just some other light play wear. So the kid must have used it enough to you know get some wear on it but not enough to really make this look super old and i think it's looking pretty good here all original seeing as this one was a case queen it did not see a lot of sunlight and that's apparent in this black light test but it glows enough to know that there's been no touch-ups or repairs or anything take a quick look around the edges everything's looking good there as well as on the back and the neck is also looking the way I would want to see. No breaks, cracks, or repairs, thankfully. And as always, only the headstock binding gloves. This instrument still retains its original Gibson USA case. You have four latches on the front. It's got some light scratches from shipping and natural storage wear, but your handle's still present and everything functions the way it should. The interior of the case is white. You have good heel support, double neck rest. You've got some very light staining at the top of the case there from dirty strings, but for the most part, that's in pretty darn good shape. Inside your case compartment, you do have some case candy, which in this case refers to the Gibson Gold warranty pamphlet, the packing checklist, the owner's manual, a printout of the Gibson website for this one, a silica gel packet, the truss rod adjustment tool, and the little paperwork that told you what strings were on this new. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson Midtown Kalamazoo, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale ad. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.